good morning and God's morning to you. Welcome to this week's episode of Apostle of the Future, where we are dumping, jumping into today uh, what is always a hot topic in the body of Christ as far as God judging and his motivations for judging. So go ahead and share, 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 share this broadcast as we delve into what is really, what is God really thinking when he's judging someone or a nation, a circumstance, a situation? We, in Apostle of the Future, whether you are an apostle, prophet, apostolic Christian, preacher of the gospel in any dimension and area, we have to be well-versed. Good morning, saints, for tuning in. We have to be well-versed in God's motivations. I have a theater background, and one of the old lines is, what's my motivation? An actor needs to know what is motivating the character on the stage so they know how to accurately represent what that character is supposed to be doing. Am I happy? Am I sad? Am I angry? Was I betrayed? Am I confused? And that the, the motivation completely alters not just how that actor delivers whatever their lines are, but also how it will be received by those who are watching and observing. And so today we're going to jump in. So you will need, I, <laughs> I think my prophet's dictionary is still at home from being on quarantine. So I had to break out my old first prophet's dictionary that I ever had. I still have it. Dr. Price signed it. My prayer for Ashley is that her season has, let me see, that her season has, has something, hastens for her to bear fruit. Dr. Price, this was in probably 2001, maybe 2000, 2001 that she signed this. I think I have a little bit of fruit now. And we will also be using our other book, our book of the broadcast here, Eternities Generals. This is the book on apostleship that Dr. Paula Price wrote many years ago, but it is an essential guide and comprehensive tool for contemporary apostles. That's why we're using it in Apostle of the Future, which is dealing with contemporary apostleship particularly in this millennial age. Very important to know. So go ahead and share, share, share as we're jumping in to today's topic. I want to know from you how these broadcasts are helping you, blessing you, changing your life. I say on a regular basis, if you have anything that you want me to tackle pertaining to the office of the apostle, let me know. Uh, I'm not pointing fingers here at other ministers, at least not directly. Huh. We're not doing uh, those kind of things at, the, at this juncture because we're laying down a foundation. There is certainly a time and a place for that. There is also a scriptural precedence for that. When you study the apostles, when you study the epistles, they will tell you if somebody is out there, heretical, somebody is out there preaching another gospel, label them, mark them. How do we mark them? You name names so people know this person is a danger to the kingdom. Uh, we know our, our contemporary uh, way of, of the gospel is to just be nice and be quiet and be silent. And what? Let people go to hell under a false doctrine. It's not happening. It's certainly not happening here. At this point, again, in our broadcast, it is about laying that foundation for why this office was set up, why God had it, why we are in it today. Apostles, women are apostles. There were, Junius was named in the New Testament as a woman apostle. There are so many things that we could argue about. In the end, we are all, those not born Jews, Gentiles. So if the argument is who should or should not touch the word of God, then any Gentile shouldn't touch the word if that's going to be the argument. But that's why Paul was sent to the Gentiles, Peter to the Jews, Paul to the Gentiles. So the argument is going to have to be across the board or not. But today, again, good morning, good morning, good morning, God's morning to you all who are on. We are jumping in here. So, dun 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 dun, dun. Okay, let's see. Today's under the microscope. We're going under the microscope with the Prophet's Dictionary, if you have your Prophet's Dictionary, get it out. We're going to term 345. This is tied to today's hot topic that we will be addressing 
in Apostle of Future, but dark sayings. Why are we talking? I got to break it in here. Actually, this book is like the seams. Well, can you see? I don't know if you can see because it's all white. The seams are busted apart. It's pretty broken in. <laughs> We've done a good job here breaking it in over the years. Number 345 is about dark sayings. Dark sayings. Another word for dark sayings is parables. Did you know that? It's parables. When Jesus told his parables, many times afterwards, when everybody had went home, his disciples would say, Rabbi, what did you, what did you just say? <laughs> right? He would lay it out. And then later on, they were like, huh, huh? Uh, uh. Do you ever sit under somebody's message and it's all deep and spiritual? And you're like nodding your head in front of everybody else. And later on, you're thinking, what did that mean exactly? Because he wrapped it up and it was a dark say. And so another word is that, however, what Psalm 78 to Psalm 78 to and Proverbs 1 6 referred to goes beyond just parables. Their meanings include the analogous enigmatic, veiled, or illusion. For prophets, the ability to understand and interpret veiled spiritual language. Veiled spiritual language is essential since God uses this form of communication most often. If you have your problems dictionary, I'm going to underline here. And mine, I want you to underline most often. See, if you're a prophet who is relying on the obvious as a means of confirmation of what you're doing, then you're not operating in your prophetics. The prophetic is about tapping into what is not obvious to man, to the natural eye, to carnal flesh, to whatever. That is the essence, the one of the hubs of the prophet's mantle. The apostles as well is to go in beyond what's obvious, beyond what is clear for everybody else and to say, no, this is, uh, uh, uh when I do my apostolic advisements, my prophetic apostolic advisements, I have to engage my mantle. Write that down. Engage my mantle. You have to engage your mantle in whatever you are doing as an apostle and as a prophet. It's not just waiting for it to flip on. You have to intentionally engage. What is a, an example of that? Starting a car. You have to ignite. You have to hit the ignition on your car. Now you hit it. Depending on what you drive, you have a key, you put it in, you turn it, you push a button, you flip a switch. I mean, goodness, now you have to almost get in it and study the book <laughs> the, the, just to turn the car on. And so you have to engage that mantle. Prayer is engaging in the spirit realm. You have to intentionally connect it together. When two people get engaged, we make it all, you know, it's romantic and well, they're engaged. But what does that actually mean? That means they are yoking up together with intent. There is an intention that comes from an engagement. The next step is marriage. But what's the point of marriage? It is taking that engagement to another level. So you have to engage your mantle in dealing with the things of God. It doesn't just fall from the sky on anybody. Dr. Price, us, you, whoever you are watching, no matter what office you sit in, no matter what your job is, you have to engage your intelligence. You have to engage your instincts. You have to engage your mind, your concentration. You have to plug in to what God is doing or what he has called you to do or whatever your job is. If not, you will be hit and miss. I don't know why sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't. It's because sometimes you're being intentional and sometimes you're just being hopeful. We cannot just hopefully exercise our apostleship. We can't hopefully exercise whenever I'm reading something, I'm turning up my, and especially now in this dispensation of fake news and fake prophecy and fake preaching and fake preachers and fake ministers all over the place in the kingdom. You do have to engage that mantle and turn it up, tune that thing up. What is that? What am I hearing? Discernment of spirits is on purpose. You have to intentionally listen and see in the spirit realm what's going on behind the scenes. What is that? What, what is that spirit I'm hearing in the undercurrent of somebody's voice? There are people I never have to see their face that if I hear them, I'll say they're a liar or that's the truth. Oh, that's God right there. 
Yep. Mm -hmm. And if the facts don't present themselves immediately, you have to dig and dig and dig until you find it and can say, aha, this is why just prophesying without doing your research can get you into trouble many times. Because if, because again, we are dealing with things that are most often veiled spiritual language, veiled. Go behind the veil. A veil covers you. You can have a veil. Typically, uh, when we are talking in our modern application, they're sheer. But a veil is something that covers you. And so if you are veiled, if something is veiled, you have to go. What do we say with the Lord? Go behind the veil, not look through it. Typically, when we think veil, we think here comes the bride. She's wearing a veil. It's just so pretty. It's 10 feet long. It's whatever. But when we're talking about the application of the Lord and going behind the veil, that's a heavy weight. That's a heavy thing that you go behind because behind the veil is typically the way we use it with the Lord. Something sacred, something precious, something powerful that can take you out if it's mishandled. So the mysteries are behind a veil. We have to engage that mantle engage yourself with intention i lead praise and worship i have to engage myself in the service not just stand up and sing some songs there's a difference between when somebody stands up and sings and when they engage that mantle because things rise they move god flows you get different dynamics sometimes you're breaking into a sweat depending on how your anointing moves uh, some people, it, they cry when the anointing hits them. Others, they holler, they shout, they run. Some people get quiet. Uh, it, it all depends on how God moves through you and dispenses to his people. And there's different ways when he's moving on you just to touch you versus when you have to actually pour out onto his people as a minister. That's a whole other subject altogether. But going back to dark sayings. Again, I'll read this statement for prophets, the ability to understand and interpret veiled spiritual language. If you did not underline that, underline that veiled spiritual language, which means you have to work. Interpreting takes work, work, work. You know, you cannot interpret if you do not know the subject of which you are interpreting. And you cannot communicate unless you know the language of your listener. For example, we have several medical professional and scientific people in our ministry. There's a language for the field of medicine. And then there's what we call layman's terms where medical professionals will rattle off a series of things in their language that makes complete sense to them. To the person sitting on the other side of the diagnosis, they're like, what did you, are you telling me I'm dying? Oh, no, 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 no. We just need to go lance that thing. <laughs> okay, because see, thank you. That's all I needed to know. And, but you have to know, so the doctor has to be a master of medical language and a master of layman's terms so that the diagnosis is accurate and then the interpretation of that is rightly given and applied to the patient sitting on the other side of their desk, listening for them. This is why it's important that apostles and prophets have to know the word. We Can I tell you, we have to know the word of God and we have to know why he wrote it. That's what we're going to get into today about God judging and his reasons for judging. Because if we get it wrong, his people get it wrong. Right now, what are we seeing in epidemic proportions? Ministers and churches making all kinds of decisions for the comfort of their people. Why? Because they were told and then they told them that God doesn't care as long as you just come. That's what, the, that's in essence, that's the tone. God doesn't care what you look like. He doesn't care what you sound like. He doesn't care. Any of those things just show up. And you know what? In the beginning, that is true. Come on, come on. When you're going and preaching the gospel, you're going in the hedges and the highways and the byways and the hedges. And you're like, hey, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, to, come on to the feast. Let's go, let's go, let's go. But once you meet the king or as you go in, you begin to upgrade. It's the way of kings. It's just the way of kings. There's not a, a person. Will, if, if we were to meet the queen of England right now, everybody is going shopping. <laughs> it doesn't matter how hard your finances were hit with this quarantine 
anything. You're going to find the resources to get the absolute best thing that you can find for the queen. That's the earthly queen. How much more our king, king of kings and lord of lords. So we have to understand why he wrote what he wrote and then communicate to his people, this isn't going to fly. How do we know? We go all the way back with Moses and Aaron. Their sons cutting the fool, laying down the law. God comes, takes Aaron's sons out, kills them. We see what happened with Moses' sons as well. It's, it's epidemic. Oh, well, you're a successor. Your greatest challenge is going to be doing it the way God gave it to your predecessor and doing it for the same reasons. That's rough. If you have conflict in your heart, if you don't agree, if you think there's a better way, you're going to be a terrible successor. I'm going to tell you that right now. And this is for whomever is listening and whoever needs to hear this. If you are in line to be a successor the way I am, you have to not only agree with the platform, you have to agree with the methods. I'm not saying, for example, technology. There are better ways now and more efficient ways, more expeditious ways for us to deliver the gospel like we're doing right now because we have this technology. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a fundamental agreement on how and why your leader, your success, your pre predecessor is doing it the way they're doing it. If at any point in your heart, you are meditating on how when you take over or if the phrase, if I was in charge, I wouldn't do this this way, crosses your mind, you will ultimately deteriorate the uh, integrity of what your predecessor has done, period. There's a reason when Joshua was set up to take over for Moses, Moses is dead, my servant is dead, let's go because he had been groomed for this. This was not some uh, Russian roulette, <laughs> okay? They didn't spin the roulette wheel in the middle of the nation and say, who's going to be Moses' successor? Everybody knew it was Joshua, everybody, because he was trained, he was groomed. He, re he removed himself from the people and lived with Moses in the tent. They said he went in and didn't come out. He completely immersed himself. So he was learning that law. He was learning God's heart. He was meeting God for himself and not just going through Moses as an intermediary. I'm sure over the years, as he elevated in his training and readiness, he had his own encounters with the Lord God Almighty. And so if you are set up, so when God said to him, you must do everything according to, look, do I need to get my Bible? I have my Bible. This is my Bible. We'll come back to Ezekiel. That's where we'll be later. Going to Joshua. This is really important. Taking this succession side rope. Hope that's okay. As he, this is Joshua chapter one. And he's going in. So he has spent years being groomed, schooled, corrected, strengthened. He sat, as we say, at Moses' feet and heard God's heart. He heard him. When you think about what the word says about Moses coming all the way down to Hebrews, uh, what, how Moses is talked about it. Oh, wait, is that Moses or is that Abraham? Am I getting my people mixed up? I don't want to get my people mixed up. What the word says about Moses and who he was to the Lord, that was imparted into Joshua, had to be, in order for God to rely on him and trust him. And it says in Joshua, and after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant. You know, the word talks about you being an assistant, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over, because Moses went up to the mountain to die. He didn't lay down in his tent and by the water and basking. He had to work to see the promise, and that was that. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. See, God could not transition and shift his nation, unfortunately, until the old guard died out, including Moses. 
Moses had to die. Not just that first generation. We talk about the Joshua generation that was raised up and everybody died before them. But Moses had to die too in order for the next leg of the promise to be fulfilled. And he says here, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you as I said to Moses, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness in this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea, uh, toward, the sea toward the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. See, we don't want to say that uh, the Lord gave this statement to Joshua when he was about to throw him into a mighty battle. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left from it. Oh, uh, to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. There is a stream of prosperity in obeying God's laws. We think you only get rich by selling out. But here it says that you will prosper wherever you go by adhering to the law. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that it is written that is written in it. <clears throat> For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Do you see how we teach what is not written in the word? Have I not commanded you be strong and of good courage? Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. There is pro there's a promise of prosperity by obeying the word of God. There is an economy. There is a stream. Whenever you get a prophecy and you obey that thing to the letter, you get the maximum fruit out of it. Whenever you would hear, we know as, as uh, citizens in our nation, not saying there's not corruption. Obviously, there's corruption everywhere. But when you obey the law, usually you stay out of the crosshairs of prosecution. Again, not saying there isn't corruption because there is. But typically, the police officer, when you flying down the street, if you're doing 90, I mean, someday... It, and when we were uh, in quarantine here in Tulsa and everybody knew the cops weren't on the street, there was some interesting driving going on. And now that they're out, we have returned to normalcy and safety, okay? And not nearly killing somebody going 65 miles an hour, 75, 70 miles an hour in a 40 mile an hour zone. So there is that promise in that, uh, in obeying the law. If you are someone who is, again, I'm going to say, in line for succession you need to examine your heart and make sure that you are following the instructions and you have it in your heart to follow <coughs> the instructions that god gave your predecessor if you disagree in those ways you need to have integrity and say you know what i'm not the one for the job i'm gonna i need to do something else or just fall in line with everyone else because you're going to take it off course, and that's not what God needs. In the book of Daniel, chapters 2, 1 and 2, the prophet is said to have been endowed by the Lord with such special abilities for his ministry. Again, we're going back to dark sayings and being able to interpret veiled spiritual messages. Daniel ultimately became known for his unsurpassed, say unsurpassed to yourself, un surpassed ability to interpret dreams the main source of dark sayings solve riddles and explains enigmas a revelation of hidden mysteries of god's kingdom babylonian royalty's use of this gift benefited god's kingdom where daniel lived and was often called upon and you can go through the rest of this definition because it is very very good and very juicy dark sayings you can see here on the screen number 345 in the prophet's dictionary why is that important for where we are right now? 
Well, uh, we're, there's so much going on that we never thought we would see in the world, right? Who ever thought we would be on lockdown? Who ever thought that we would have somebody, one man sitting up there talking about this flu is, it's not, you just have to stay, the whole, the economy is collapsing in this country. Talking about, no, 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 it's just not safe. No, no, no. You have to have an ear to go past that. But more, more to the point on today's emphasis about God's motives for judging. Do, 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 do. Again, share, share, share. God's motives for judging. And this is God's motives for judging according to what he said are his motives. Not what we say, but what he says are his motives. We are going to be back in Ezekiel 14. Now we were in Ezekiel 14 at the beginning talking about these men have set up their idols in their hearts and put before them that which causes them to stumble into iniquity. Should I let myself be inquired of at all by them? Same line of thought. This is the same chapter. Now we're jumping to the end of the chapter. I want you to tell yourself, God is a person and he has feelings. God is a person and he has feelings. God is a person and he has feelings. He has thoughts. He says his thoughts, his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. You thought I was altogether like you. He goes on and on to let us know he is a person. We are made in his image and his likeness as people. So when Jesus came to earth, he was the physical expression of God the Father. We're just making and connecting dots here as we're jumping into our emphasis for today. He is a person and he has feelings. He has ideas about what he wants. He has plans. He says, I am the Alpha. He is the Omega. He is the beginning. He is the end. He has sought this thing all the way through. It has already played out in him. And now we are the ones walking it out. And so why does God judge? What, what What's going through his mind? We don't even think that God has a mind. But how can he have thoughts if he doesn't have a mind? Are you with me? How can that be? Because we oftentimes think of God as this entity that we call upon. Not a being, a person. Scripture talks about his beard, right? His hair, the train of his robe. If I pull out my glittering sword, he he is saying things that we do as people. So I want you to get an image and not just, you know, somebody who looks like Santa Claus. Thank you very much. Okay, not Santa, the Lord God Almighty. So he is a person. He has thoughts. He has ideas. He has intentions. He makes decisions. The evening and the morning were the first day. That's a decision by God. Let there be light. That's a decision. In the beginning, God. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning. All right. I'm thinking the point is made here. So we are in E.G. Eternity's Generals here, chapter 5. Under the header of a portrait of God's world conflicts is the subheader. The passages of scripture below when she outlines them are in, were included to present a portrait of the Lord's world conflicts. I want you to write that down. The world's the Lord's world conflicts. God once said through the prophet Ezekiel and we're going to jump there because I found what she was talking about that after after he God completed his judgment of the land and the nations that the prophet would see that God does nothing without a cause. This is why prophets must be well-versed in the prophets' writings. This is why apostles must be well-versed in the prophets' writings. This is why everybody who preaches the gospel, the campaign to say the Old Testament isn't necessary because we have the New, was nothing but demonic had to be who else would tell you you do not need to know god's mind the devil satan doesn't want us to know god's mind because the more we know his mind that means the more we can anticipate what satan is going to do when you know this word 
you can see something for what it is almost immediately. It's like when you really, 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 really know somebody, they walk in the room a certain way and you know what's about to happen. We can tell. Those of us, Profit and Training Norma is in here with me, who have rolled with Dr. Price for a long time as her assistants and her team. She steps in that door a certain kind of way. We know it's about to go down. Somebody cut straight up. What is happening? That actually does not happen often, contrary to what people may think. She steps in. You can hear get off the elevator. Praise the Lord. You're like, ah, oh, it's going to be a good day. Yes, it's already been a good day. Praising Jesus in the car on my way in. The Lord is moving. But you have to know somebody. Read their work. So with God, knowing this is how you know when certain things start to happen in the earth, what frame of mind he's in. Oh, Lord, Dr. Price said about President Obama, if this man becomes president, we are in trouble as a church and as a nation. And if he gets in a second term, all hell's going to break loose in this land because that's why he's here. And as we saw and things rolled out very Antichrist, uh, if you actually look at the things that he did not do as a president, the first president who didn't do this, the first president who didn't do that pertaining to Christendom, very interesting, uh, very friendly toward other religions. And I mean, like, squeeze Christianity out, bring everybody else in. Second term was all about the homosexual agenda, which was always his agenda, to push laws for them. We as African Americans were like, hey, we finally got a president. Who did what for us? nothing that was not his goal that was not his agenda if that's going to be your reason for standing with somebody as a christian very but see to those who had an ear to the lord and knew this word knew that leader was going to do that to this nation because those types of leaders always historically did <clears throat> that's why you have got to know judges you have to know first and second kings and then you can see the pattern of righteous and unrighteous leaders for the Lord. Again, like I said, I don't need my president to be a pastor. Don't be a pastor. These, these folk got the foulest mouths you've ever heard, can cuss you out 16 ways in probably three different languages under the table. I'll pray for your soul, but I need you to pass these laws that will make me as a Christian safe in my own country. We have got to grow up in our expectations of our leaders and, and also grow up in our, our own Christianity to say, I can't stand this person personally, but they're getting something done for God. That's hard, but that takes integrity and that takes maturity. They get on my nerves. I can't stand the sound of their voice. Hey, racist, not racist. I don't, honestly, I really don't know too many people in high places who aren't black or white. If that's going to be the case, I know we always feel as African-Americans, we have a right to have a problem with people who are not black. It's still racism. It's still hatred, no matter what your motivation, because you feel just as valid about how you feel as somebody else and everybody's wrong together for hating an entire people group or most people because of the color of their skin and your experiences with them. This is why we have the word of God, because if we do this thing according to the wisdom of the flesh, then we will destroy everything in our hands. It is hard. It is not easy, but that is God nonetheless. That's why he talks about righteousness, justice, injustice. That's why he talks about uh, 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 um, uh, all the things, I'll just say this, all the things that he does are not about feelings. He deals with thoughts and intents of the heart. You have got to deal with people based on it, who they are as an individual. But the thoughts and the intents of that person's heart are different from the thoughts and the intents of that person's heart. And he could be talking about identical twins. Two different people, two different spirits, two different souls. Well, this person over here, total problem. This one over here, born in the same family, raised in the same house, not like anybody else in their family. We have got to do better. Not easy to say, but it's God anyhow. So here we go. Again, talking about that God does nothing without a cause. Ezekiel 14. So the beginning of Ezekiel 14, it says, The Lord will answer him who comes according to the multitude of his gods, that I may seize the house of Israel by her by their heart, 
because they are all estranged from me by their idols. This is the beginning of what he is saying. We're estranged. The fact that we're so carnal as Christians right now in our country means we are estranged from God. That we can't recognize Jesus Christ from the man on the moon. We can't determine. We're arguing about things that have nothing to do with redemption, nothing to do with salvation, nothing to do with people's souls. It's all about my personal belief system and this is what I believe in. This is how I see it. And I can't believe you support this person. I can't believe you don't support that one and on and on. Never once putting on the table God's issues and problems. If you are an apostle, if you are a prophet, our job is to champion God's issues and God's problems first. This is why we say this is not always a popular position to be in. No matter what people group you belong to. It doesn't matter when the Lord raises up and says, but I have a problem with this and who will go for us? Who is going to come to the aid of the Lord? Who is going to stand in the midst of who is willing to be thrown into the fiery furnace and the lion's den? The list gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller <laughs> when you start doing that because it's not about being popular. It's about being righteous. And we as first and second officers in particular, our, our job is to be loyal to the throne, to the throne. So when the Lord stands up and says, I have a problem with this person and it's everybody's favorite person, you're like, no, <laughs> please say it ain't so Jesus, not them. Yep. And you're the one who's going to, to be my voice and my representative in the earth. <laughs> okay. And I want you to go public. I want you to go live. I want you to say it. And you're like, oh, God, why? That's why we are here. Because if we don't do it, who will? Well, I'm just going to leave it up to God to take care of it. Through what means exactly? Well, he's God. <laughs> okay. This is when we use the he's God default setting. It's not my responsibility. It's not my job. The God I serve doesn't want me to suffer. But he wants himself to suffer. He wants his people to suffer. The Lord knows we're on a whole campaign, our apostles and prophets, a prayer campaign. And part of that is even uh, as she was highlighting in Daniel in our term or under the microscope term about dark saints, uh, he, he says that he reveals secrets. He's the God who reveals secrets. You know what that means? That means he knows secrets. He knows what people are doing behind the scenes and he knows what they're not doing. There are flat out lies that we believe about people that are not true, but God knows they're not true. So he'll tell us, defend somebody that we think they're defenseless. Like why? But they, huh? I just don't even think, I just don't even know. And you may never know. And then there's somebody who looks like they're the world favorite. In fact, if they are the world favorite, I don't know. And he'll say, I have a problem with them. You do, but they've built up 16 neighborhoods and they have a mega ministry or they've built orphanages in Africa. They're an amazing humanitarian. Uh-huh. But I have a problem with them. And the righteous servants of God will pursue it. Well, Lord, what is your problem? What is the problem here? And he might tell you they're using this to cover that. They're actually trafficking people. They're trafficking drugs. They're beating their spouse. They're robbing the ministry blind. They're a closet homosexual. See, there's a lot of things that we do to God. And, and our apostle has taught us this for years. And the word of God backs it up. There are things that people do to the Lord. Ezekiel chapter 8. Leaders behind the scenes worshiping other gods. Doing all kind of debauchery and diabolical things. Which is why Ezekiel chapter 9. The Lord sends out the judgment from heaven to to judge these people and their people for what they have done uh, exodus 12 12 against all the gods of egypt i will execute my judgment the lord is executing judgment against those gods against them against what they did to his people and what they did to other people i'm sure and the other gods that they worshipped. And he had to bring that entire empire down to do it. 
his motives are actually very clearly stated in scripture. And so we're here, Ezekiel, oh, Ezekiel, yes, Ezekiel 14. You can read the whole chapter. I actually encourage you really to read this whole book. Um, it's not one of the books that you hear a lot of prophets or ministers in general, apostles, talking about when they are getting their prophetic info. But where we are right now, the things that have come to light, where we are as a nation, we have got to back God's decisions. But first, you have got to recognize that it is the Lord's decision. You saying you don't think that God put our president in office because you don't like him is not reason enough. You saying that I just don't believe that God would use somebody who, and half of this stuff, you actually can't prove. You can't prove that what you've heard about him is true. It's just you heard it, you heard it, you heard it, you heard it, you heard it. Well, this is how we deal with God. I just don't believe that a loving God would allow my favorite person to die of a disease. I don't believe that a loving God would allow me to lose my job. <laughs> she looks over her shoulder. That's hilarious. <laughs> okay. I just don't believe it. Now, he's giving you five words of prophecy to prepare you for that day. Somebody passing, you losing your job, your car blowing up on the side of the highway. It really doesn't matter. Prophecy has come down. Word has come down. Unction has come down. Something, even if, was, even if it was, you had a feeling. A lot of times, the Lord will impress upon us to do something. And it's not a, thus saith the Lord, because there are plenty of people who do not have a prophet directly in their life. I mean, it took me, I was raised in a really good church, really good church, my whole life, and did not have that. But I had dreams. I had impressions from God. I would find things in his word. He still communicated to me very clearly. I didn't always know what to do with it, <laughs> but the communication was clear. And so here we are. God is clearly communicating. Prophets are supposed to clearly communicate for the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, or God says, the Lord says, he's showing me, I saw in a dream, he's telling me, there, uh, there's, he is impressing upon me to do or to say or to write or whatever. Okay, so you need to read this whole chapter. Coming to verse 21 here, ha, uh, honing in on our point. For thus says the Lord God, how much more, yes, how much more it shall be when I send my four severe judgments on Jerusalem, the sword and famine and wild beasts and pestilence to cut off man and beast from it? Yeah, that's in the word, folks. Yet behold, there shall be left in it a remnant, say a remnant, a remnant, who will be brought out, both sons and daughters. Surely they will come out to you, and you will see their ways and their doings. Then you will be comforted concerning the disaster, <laughs> the disaster that I have brought upon Jerusalem and that I have brought upon it. And they will comfort you when you see their ways and their doings, and you shall know that I have done nothing without a cause that I have done in it, says the Lord God. Selah. I I just, I need to take a Selah on that. Do you need a Selah? He said concerning the disasters, the disaster that I have brought upon Jerusalem. See, the way we teach it is that the Lord would never do that no matter what you do. And this is after him naming the indictment against them. He's going to indict you. You're going to know why you're judged. You can walk around saying, I have no idea. I have no idea. And, and you know what? Depending on how you're taught, you might not. But it's always here. He is always clear. This is why we as leaders, as apostles in particular, have to get it right. We have to say that is going to get you killed. That you you can initiate that if you want to, but it is going to uh provoke the Lord to wrath. How do I know? Because it always has. People, when you know somebody for any extended period of time or maybe not, maybe even just a short period of time, you can look at them and say, "Ooh, somebody did something. It's not going to work." People who know me know. 
the things that don't work. My teams know, don't do that. Mm -mm. Don't be late. Please don't be late. Don't be habitually late. Lord have mercy. Let's not be messy. Don't, don't be disrespectful. Don't be cavalier. When somebody calls upon you to do your job, don't act shocked and surprised like, why are you calling on me? Because it's your job to do. And this is how we act with the Lord. This is frightening. Ezekiel 14, 23. Again, and they will comfort you when you see their ways and their doings, and you shall know that I have done nothing without cause that I have done in it, says the Lord God. He does nothing without cause. So then what happens is when something happens, let's just say now, you have to find out what is the cause. Why Why is this rolling out? <laughs> I was talking with friends of mine about COVID-19, which if you're doing your homework, reading statistics, um, this is not the end of the world. This is not the end of the age. This is a, a ploy to capitalize off of what has rolled out into destroying the infrastructure of this nation. It's clear. It's, it's clear to those who want to see it. It's clear. I'm not saying don't follow the law, don't obey whatever. Although if you do your homework, even a lot of these governors, uh, for example, in Michigan, the, she, the governor, has extended the stay in shelter, but she actually does not have the legislative support to do it. So what's happening is people are starting to go back to work because they have not received a paycheck in six weeks and the sheriffs are not arresting them because legally she has no foundation to stand on. They voted the first time it went through for the first month, but not the extension. So you have to do your homework to know what is actually legal right now and what is not, but you have to ask God. So uh, you have to do research, but in this, the Lord's motivations for, she says here, despite humans contention, I love this, that the creator is irrational, attacking people for no reason, the prophets know that what he does to humanity, he does for very good reasons. And we have had that. Oh, who knows? Only God knows. He just, he's an angry God. He's just an angry God. He just slapped those people for no reason. No, he didn't. Nowhere ever in the word of God did he just slap people. Now, Greek gods, yes, they, they're angry. You don't know how to appease them. And see, we've lumped our God with the Greek gods and all these other fallen gods thinking that it's one and the same. And it's really not. It's not at all. And so she says here in uh, Eternity's Generals, his judgments are unquestionably, unquestionably well-deserved when people study his commandments, laws, and testimonies and contrast them with their own lives. And so she lists out here Isaiah, oh my goodness, several verses in Isaiah, Isaiah 43, 10. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there is no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Wow. Isaiah 44, 6, thus saith the Lord God, uh, the Lord, the King of Israel, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, I am the last, and beside me there is no God. See, we have to either determine to believe the entire Old Testament or not. We cherry pick, we cherry pick the gospel. We want to believe faith. Uh, guys, faith did not originate in the New Testament. That was the Old Testament. Actually, the whole thing we stand on, faith, 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 Old Testament principle. Abraham, it was accounted unto him. Abraham, faith. Noah had to have faith that God was about to destroy the earth with something that they had never seen before. Faith, Old Testament. Oops, we can stop right there. Prosperity, Old Testament. We have got to stop picking selectively what we believe and what we don't believe, what we agree with and what we don't agree with, what we approve of and what we don't approve of in our Christianity. This is why we're in this mess right now. 
Well, I just don't believe that because that's the Old Testament and God is in the New. Do you believe in faith? Absolutely. It's Old Testament. Do you believe in creation? Well, yeah. Old Testament. Do you believe in the Ten Commandments? Sure. Old Testament. Whenever you, and I encourage you to challenge people, I'm giving you things to say so you can challenge people in their nonsense. And it is nonsense because it makes no sense to say, I only believe in this and not that. Jesus came to fulfill the law, not abolish it. You know what that lets us know? There was nothing wrong with it. But they were changing the delivery system, the means. They were taking it to the Gentiles. We were no longer going to have to sacrifice and the blood, grace, redemption. He was making it more efficient, <laughs> okay? We have to make this efficient for the world. And now we're bringing people back home and not just keeping this locked down to the earth realm. Let's see here. Going to Hosea 13, 4. She says, the word says, she has in the book, but the Bible says, yet I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, and thou shalt know, no God, K-N-O-W, no, no God but me, for there is no Savior beside me. Wait a minute. God said to Hosea that he was a Savior? Because I thought Savior didn't happen until Jesus walked the planet. He did, it wasn't even mentioned. Again, that's Hosea 13, 4. Look it up yourself. Don't believe me. Look it up yourself. There is no Savior beside me. This is King James as well. And, you know, different translations change things. So King James is quite uh, kingly. Deuteronomy 32, 39. Deuteronomy 32, 39. See now that I, even I, am he and there is no God with me, I kill, and I make alive, I wound, and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. Deuteronomy. That's the one we serve right now. This is the one we serve right now. Second Kings 5.15, And he returned to the man of God, and he said all his company and came, he and all his company, and came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. So he knew. First Chronicles 16, 26. For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Exodus 12, 12. I talked about this earlier. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite all the firstborn of the land, both man and beast, and against all. All the gods of Egypt, I will execute my judgment. I am the Lord. Most people don't really consider that the Lord killed all the firstborn animals too. That land had to stink. Ah, oh, woo! The carnage that came out of those ten plagues. Oh my God! You're talking about Egypt, which was the massive empire. It went from being a massive empire to being a wasteland, a complete and total wasteland. The firstborn dead that came out of the womb of both people and animals. That's a lot of dying. My God, that's a lot of death. I'm just trying to, every time I even think about it, I'm like, woo, there's not enough graves. You, There's just not enough fires to burn that kind of flesh. I mean, the stink of death that went up and went out. I am sure you could smell death for miles and miles and miles. Because in Oklahoma, when we have fires, when, you know, sometimes, and, and there could be a fire 200 miles away, and that, that thing is carrying on the wind, and you can smell it here. And you're like, wow, is something burning? And you're like, yeah, 200 miles away, it's burning. When California was a uh, fire, I know in Portland uh, several years ago, uh, members of Near who lived out there, they would take pictures of ash falling on their cars from miles away. So the stench, God's destruction was smelt <laughs> for miles around Egypt. Crazy. But he is clear. Zephaniah 2.11, the Lord will be terrible unto them. 
for he will famish all the gods of the earth, and men shall worship him, every one from his place, even all the isles of the heathen. <laughs> yeah, get this book. Get this book. What I love about this book is that it's its own built-in Bible study. You can take a whole month just to study those scriptures. I didn't even read all of them about who the Lord says he is. Can we go back to saying who God said he was? Not who our pastor said, not who the sermon said, not what our favorite song said. Find it in scripture and not just an ounce of a piece of scripture that got parlayed into an entire movement. I mean, what are God's thoughts? Plural. What are his intents? Plural. What is he going after in all of creation? Also, I want to end on this. If you are able in June 17th through the 19th, our Tulsa Prophetic Training Institute, we are still having our event in T-Town. And the theme is 2020 Prophetics and God's Hard Reset. God starts everything with a prophet. Wow. God starts everything with the prophet. Boom. He, the prophets are the initiators and they're the igniters as well as many other things. So when you see the prophets start kicking up, first you need to listen and see God and find out what's going on. The Lord has spoken. Who can but prophesy? And when you start hearing things, rumblings and utterings in the kingdom, please don't be shallow. Talking about copycat prophets. Are you kidding me? Huh. <sighs> We need to be saying the same thing. Now, if you actually copy, literally verbatim, somebody else's prophecy and don't give them credit, that's prophetic plagiarism, okay? Don't be a plagiarizing prophet. If you are repeating what somebody else said, then give them credit for it. We do it. I mean, goodness, we're reading scripture and we're saying, uh, the prophet Isaiah said, the prophet Ezekiel said, so you can quote another prophet, but just make sure you're giving credit for quoting them and not taking another prophecy and making it your own. Don't be plagiarizing prophets or apostles. If you are an apostle and you are hearing somebody else's prophecy and you know it is God and you're repeating it, give that prophet credit, please and thank you. Especially if you're a big one and you have a huge ministry and you know people are following, you know you pimp that word off of somebody else. Don't be that, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Let's be righteous and have integrity because in the world it's plagiarism, it's punishable, and you can be uh, dismissed and shut out of an entire training program or school because of plagiarism and you will not get into another one because you will be marked. All right. Okay. Hey, well, listen, we've come to the end of another broadcast today with Apostle of the Future. I want to thank you for tuning in, staying faithful. Go ahead and again, share this broadcast. We need this information. We have to share it so we can be thinking the same things and not thinking the same things of man, but thinking the same things of God. Can we all be in God's mind as we continue in our journey? Well, God bless you all. Have a great day. I'll see you either tomorrow on the Paula Price Show or Friday in the midnight hour. I don't know. I'm thinking I might do another prayer pop-up this week. God bless you all. See you soon.